Eco-criticism is the study of the relationship between literature and the physical environment. Before we begin, here are some important definitions we have to know. Ecology is the relationship between the air, land, water, animals and plants, etc. Usually of a particular area or the scientific study of this. Environmentalism, on the other hand, is protecting the earth from human pollution and destruction. While eco-criticism is not just the study of nature and literature, Eco-criticism has distinguished itself by the ethical stand it takes, its commitment to the natural world as an important thing, rather than simply as an object of thematic study. Anthropocentrism, regarding humans as the universe's most important entity. This is the main enemy to environmentalism. Literary theory, in general, examines the relations between writers, texts, and the world. In most literary theory, the world is synonymous with society. However, Ecocriticism expands this notion of the world to include the entire ecosphere. Barry Commander's first law of ecology states that everything is connected to everything else. It then follows that literature does not float above the material world, but rather plays a part in an immensely complex global system in which energy, matter, humans, nature, and ideas all interact. When presenting an ecocritical reading, it may be helpful to ask yourself some of the following types of questions. How is nature represented in this sonnet or other literary piece? What role does the physical setting play in the plot of this novel? Are the values expressed in this play consistent with ecological wisdom? How do our metaphors of the land influence the way we treat it? And what is the relationship between man and nature in this literary piece? Once these questions have been answered, it hopefully becomes obvious as to the possible meanings of the piece of literature in question, whether that be environmental restoration, or perhaps the opposite, how dangerous nature can be. All ecological criticism shares the fundamental premise that human culture is connected to the physical world, affecting it and affected by it. Therefore, one can take as a subject of an ecocritical piece the interconnections between nature and culture. This can then be expanded to be a broad thesis for any ecocritical eco piece. Generally, the theoretical discourse is a negotiation between the human and the non-human. Most eco-critical work also shares a common motivation, the troubling awareness that we have reached the age of environmental limits, a time when the consequences of human actions are damaging the planet's basic life support systems. This awareness may spark a possible reader response of a sincere desire to contribute to environmental restoration. Why is eco-criticism a new way of reading? Well, this is because up until recently, the anthropocentric idea about the world has been heavily naturalised. For example, in the Hebrew, Hebrew creation in Genesis 1, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his own benefit. In addition, classical tragedy also enforces the assumption that nature exists for the benefit of mankind, as does the pastoral tradition which depicts a tamed and idealised nature ready to be controlled by man. Many of the works of Wordsworth and other romantic poets of the time can be analysed in an eco-critical manner, as Wordsworth did not view nature in, in enlightenment terms, something which must be tamed, ordered and utilised. Wordsworth saw nature as an area to be inhabited and reflected upon. In Britain in the 19th century, the Romantic poets reacted strongly against the 18th century emphasis on reason and sought new ways of expressing their thoughts and feelings. Wordsworth, considered by many to be the spokesman of this movement, celebrates the beauty and mystery of nature in some of his most famous lyrics, including Michael, written in 1800, which portrays a simple shepherd who is deeply attached to the natural world around him. His autobiographical poem, The Prelude, in 1850, records the poet's evolving understanding of nature, and the excursion, 1814, is a long philosophical reflection on the relationship of humanity and nature. The poetry of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, John Keats, Lord Byron and Percy Shelley also include emotional descriptions of the natural world and feature some of the best known nature verses in English. Shelley's Ode to the West, for example, has been called the most inspired lyrical poem describing nature in the English language. The romantic interest in nature is particularly significant to eco-critics because these poets were revolutionary in their politics and the preservation of the natural world was one element of their radical thinking. You might be thinking, well, this is all well and good, but how do I actually present a reading in an eco-critical manner? 
Hopefully I'll answer this by using Robert Frost as an example. Firstly, we ask ourselves the questions previously mentioned. How is nature represented in this piece? The snippet of the poem, The Trail by Existence, by Frost, seems to be using snow c to convey his meanings. Next, we ponder the characteristics of snow to decipher its role in the piece. Snow is a symbol of winter, the eternal, and also represents the life and death. However, in the context of this poem, snow as the light of heaven, by a quote, shows religious undertone for the snow. From this, we could argue that snow as a traditional symbol is employed by F Frost to depict his thoughts of the eternal. For Frost, all seasons lead out from winter, and the poems could not exist without winter and its flood of white snow. It stands a symbol for the paradox of life and death, without which spring could never awaken. His poem, The Trail by Existence, puts forth the religious connotations of this snow. To take another of Frost's poems, The West Running Brook, Frost seems to be equating the natural entity of water, which may be associated with fertility and vigour. Frost, like a true environmentalist, admires and revels in water, the elixir of life. In his West Running Brook, the stream is presented as an emblem in which a young couple recognise the running water as completing their marriage. It becomes a stream of life for them. Water from whatever source, or by whatever means that we receive it, is of course very essential to man. Frost's dedicated concern for the preservation of water becomes apparent through his words, We love the things we love for what they are. The poem Daffodils by William Wordsworth is another example of a text that could be easily read in an eco-critical manner, where the persona compares himself to a cloud. He is walking lonely as a cloud and is moving lonely in the sky over vales and hills. So the poet from the very beginning represents the idea of loneliness. The poet starts to talk about the waves which are in the lake. The waves like the daffodils are dancing. They are happy. This scene affects the poet and makes him happy as well. Contemplation of nature is the main source of happiness to all romantic poets. So his contemplation of nature, the dancing of the daffodils and the waves, is the source of his happiness, for he starts to dance with the daffodils after his heart is filled with pleasure. This explains the effect of nature on the poet, so ultimately this poem represents the beauty of nature and its effect on human beings. The Blossom is a two stanza poem following an irregular rhyme scheme the erratic nature of the rhymes parallels a seemingly illogical attitude of nature, whereas a fixed rhyme scheme echoes the perfection of nature. This looser rhyme scheme shows nature as being harder to predict, if not entirely indifferent to human conventions. The poem hides a secret criticism about nature while addressing the blossom. The speaker receives no response in either word or action. This aspect of nature is impersonal, unlike the nature of Paganism, alive with spirits and demigods of much romantic poetry. Whether a sparrow finds a home in its branches or a robin weeps, the tree, or specifically its blossom, is indifferent and merely looks on. Blake's view of nature here is of a material world operating on materialistic principles with no vital essence to give it personality or feeling. We are facing a global crisis today, not because of how our ecosystems function, but rather because of how our ethical systems function. Eco-critics -critic encourage others to think seriously about the relationship between humans and nature, about the ethical and aesthetic dilemmas posed by the environmental crisis, and about how language and literature transmit values with ecological implications. To sum this up, eco-criticism is the relationship between literature and the physical environment.